Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to Tuesday's edition of WeRSC.com's Inside the Trojans Huddle, where we tell it like it is. Friends, Inside the Trojans Huddle is a game-like panel discussion that is posted each Tuesday during the season. The huddle features WeRSC columnists, staff writers, and historians. We first start off with the pregame show, where we introduce our panel members for this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. Now let's meet Tuesday's panelists. A WeRSC columnist who writes WeRSC.com's The Monday Morass, yay or nay, and Sunday takeaways in addition to regular season football and basketball reports. He also hosts his own podcast show entitled Locked On USC. That's Mark Culkin. The editor-in-chief of WeRSC.com, columnist, national recruiting guru, producer, and moderator of WeRSC's Friday's Four Downs video show and Five Things video show, which is posted on YouTube and WeRSC.com after each and every USC football game home and away. He's a graduate of USC. That's Eric McKinney, a former William Jewell College defensive back and WeRSC columnist who writes the popular WeRSC.com column, Musings with Arledge, and the well-received Musings with Arledge solo video edition. He's a graduate of USC's law school, Chris Arledge. And a weekly WeRSC columnist who writes Fridays, the obvious, not so obvious, from the press box, IMHO Sunday, the WeRSC.com travel guide, and an active member of the Football Writers Association of America, your moderator and producer of Inside the Trojans Huddle. That's me, Greg Katz. Folks, if you enjoy WeRSC.com's Inside the Trojans Huddle, we thank you strongly and strongly encourage those of you watching on sites like YouTube to click on the like and red subscriber buttons. It's greatly valued, appreciated, and it's free. You can also listen to Inside the Trojans Huddle on most available podcast sites. And friends, speaking of WeRSC.com, we're offering a first-time subscribers unlimited premium access for what's, for just $1 for one month. If you're already a full-time premium subscriber, you want you do want to keep on subscribing. You do want to keep going. If you're not a subscriber, please sign up. I think you'll really enjoy it because WeRSC.com is a football website that really does tell it like it is. All right, let's kick off this uh, first quarter of the huddle. And uh, we've got some interesting things coming down, no doubt, after this weekend. But the first one that's caught our eye is on Sunday. It was announced by Lincoln Riley that the Trojans are have hired highly touted North Dakota State head coach Matt Entz as USC's new assistant head coach of defense and linebacker coach as well. Entz, 51 years old, has led a powerhouse North Dakota State program that has won two national championships since 2019. Entz is a two-time FCS National Coach of the Year. Entz's NDS team is currently in the FCS semifinals, looking for their third straight national championship. Entz will remain as the Bison's head coach until the conclusion of their regular season and playoff run. For the USC Trojan record, uh, we should say this season, Brian Odom has coached the inside Trojans linebackers. And Roy Manning has coached the outside linebackers. This season, Manning had the title of assistant head coach for the defense. So, panel, here we go. What do you make of the Ents hiring? What do you think? What do you know? Who's the odd man out on Riley's coaching staff? Do we know? Perhaps the panel knows. Mark Culkin, you tell us. You lead us off and tell us what you know. Uh, well, I know he's from the Midwest part of the country. <laughs> you know, I, look, North Dakota State. Fargo, North Dakota, gets cold. Um, I kind of wanted to check out his earlier coaching resume. And, you know, 16 years as a de defensive coordinator at Illinois College. Everybody raise your hand if you knew there was a Jacksonville in Illinois, because that's where that school is located. Uh, Winona State, Minnesota, that's Northern Iowa and Western Illinois. And he's been in North Dakota State since what? 20, 2009, 2014, whatever that number is. He's won two national championships as their head coach since 2019. He's a good coach. And when you play in the playoffs at that at that level, you know, a lot of the teams that go in have two or three losses when they hit the playoffs. But a sign of a good team is they get better as the season goes along. And the deeper you go into the playoffs, and if he's going for his third straight championship game, that's a sign that he's got a pretty well-coached team. 
well disciplined and they're able to carry it into into you know high leverage high pressure situations i like that and the fact that um you know he just he's been to be he's stepping down as a deep as a head coach to not just be a not a defensive coordinator but a position coach at usc um that says a lot he's willing to you know set aside himself to you know for the betterment of the team i mean a head coach humbling himself to step down and become a position coach regardless of the pay raise i i think that speaks volumes of the of the guy's character so i like this hire um now can he recruit i don't know i have no idea i don't even know if he's been to la before or not um <laughs> you look at, like i said you look at his resume where he's lived where he's coached who knows but if you can bring that type of blue collar lunch pail attitude, they get out there back to USC, which I think they've been missing a whole lot of lately. I don't think anybody should be upset with this hire. Eric, what do you think? What 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 do you see uh, as this hire goes? And any thoughts on who who might be leaving the SC coaching staff? Do we have any rumors, confirmed things? What tell us what you know. I mean, the thought immediately is that is that it's Brian Odom's position, right? I mean, there's nothing there's a, nothing confirmed at this point, and and uh, everything we're hearing, the expectation is Brian Odom's going to stay on and and be the co-defensive coordinator uh, through the Holiday Bowl because um, Matt is, is staying with North Dakota State as long as they go uh, through their playoff run, which they've got a tough one on Saturday, and and. For this, this is one of those odd years where North Dakota State does not feel like the overwhelming favorite uh, in the FCS championship uh, tournament. So, but that being said, him as a coach, yeah, the the concern about Danton Lynn is that he has been a coordinator at this level, and, and I mean at this level as in, in college, for one year. If you want to knock the Danton Lynn hiring it is absolutely that there is no, tra- he has no track record. There's no track record of he has done this multiple years in a row. You've now, you're now bringing a coach on who has been a coordinator again, not at the FBS level, but at a level that produces players. And anytime North Dakota state, it felt like played against an FBS team, absolutely hung in there and, and beat a lot of them. This guy's been a coordinator for 16 years. So now you've got a guy who's done it a ton, been a head coach, been a coordinator uh, for many years, who can now come in and, and have a say in the room when he comes in and, and comes into USC. So I think f- just from that perspective, from a perspective of a, a guy who has coached a lot of football, and knows what he's doing defensively and knows how to put a defensive game plan in at this point, if you're USC, you cannot have enough of those guys. The the idea of, of too many cooks or people that have been around too much. And what's the hierarchy you figure that out, but you want a bunch of guys who know what they're doing. And to me, what this hire really does is this is the, even with the Danton Lynn, hiring and everything that Lincoln Riley has said this to me is the first real tangible evidence of Lincoln Riley's we want to play elite defense at USC this this to me is what this hiring says is that Lincoln Riley is going to actually put something behind those words and we talked about you you have to say you have to say it first and then you can judge on what he does. This feels like a, a pretty serious step towards that direction. Again, it does, none of it's going to matter until we start seeing games in September. But the, this to me is a, is a pretty big statement where you can convince a, a sitting active winning head coach to, again, it's a step up in terms of the level, but a step down in terms of the, the job description and do that when you're trying to build uh, a defensive staff, I, I think it's it's one of those kind of kind of power moves from from USC. When you talk about if you're USC, you should be able to go out and hire whoever you want. This feels like a, a pretty significant statement, and it's on the defensive side, which is is a statement in itself. 
All right, let's move on to the panelists, defensive specialists. Of course, that's Chris Arledge. So, Chris, what's your take on this? Uh, a fantastic hire. Uh, I was I was surprised when I heard it. Remember the the two previous uh, coaches from North Dakota State had gone on to Division One jobs, Wyoming and Kansas State, and as, as head coaches. And um, and as Eric pointed out, you're talking about a guy who has tremendous college experience which means you have a pretty nice setup. Now you have, you have a defensive coordinator that is a young guy, but has quite a bit of NFL experience, which helps for recruiting, but also it's also nice to have, <laughs> to have a guy who's been at uh, on uh, a member of successful NFL defenses uh, coaching at the highest level against the, the best guys in the world. Uh, and then they have a guy who has been coaching college guys for a long time and not just coaching college guys, but look, North Dakota state may be the best program in college football over the last 15 or 20 years. I mean, Al Alabama is obviously uh, at the top of the food chain at the highest level, but, but North, but North, North Dakota state has been probably more consistent than Alabama has over the last 15 or 20 years. This is a program that has pretty consistently dominated that level. They've won a ton of national championships. Ince has won a couple himself. Um, and has pretty consistently beat up on FBS teams, as Eric mentioned. They had a streak going of six in a row until they lost to Arizona last year, I think. A game they lost 31 to 28. I mean, this is these are guys who to have that level of success that consistently means that you have a program that is extraordinarily disciplined, always focused, knows how to do the little things and does them consistently because you cannot keep that level of excellence unless you are constantly focused on the prize and you have a culture that is, that is unbelievably strong, right? You can't. Um, and so <laughs> what you're talking about is a guy who has a lot of, uh, has a, a has had a lot of success, a guy who has a lot of experience coaching defense at the college level. Um, Lynn was talking about how he needed to learn to teach college players after coming from the NFL. Ince is a guy who knows how to teach college players. He's been doing it for a very long time. Uh, and it's a guy who knows championship culture. So it's, um, it's a heck of a one-two punch with Lynn. I mean, last week we talked about uh, how I think we were all cautiously optimistic that the Lynn hire would be a good one. But I think when you pair him with, with Matt Inns, uh, now you're talking about what, what I see is an absolute home run uh, one-two punch with these two guys. They check all the boxes. I suspect they're going to work very well together. I don't think this hire would happen unless both guys thought they'd work very well together. And, and so I don't think you're going to see a situation this year where USC is constantly out schemed and where the defense is running around lost, like they don't know what they're doing. I don't think you're going to see that this year. I don't know whether USC will have the talent defensively to be an elite unit next year. I don't know that. We're going to see what happens in the transfer portal. That will help. But I bet I, I'm willing to make this bet. You're going to have a defense that knows what the hell they're doing and they play hard and they play disciplined. And that will be really nice to watch even if they're not that talented, even if they don't have great players and they can't always stop the elite teams, just to have a team that plays disciplined and plays hard, who knows their assignments and does them, a team that will occasionally actually try to keep contain, that will keep guys in front of them, that will tackle. You know how badly, you know, I mean, it's been a long time since we've seen this, right? I mean, the last three years, the last three years, the defensive performance has been about as bad as you'll ever see from a from a blue blood program and you've seen it three straight years i think that ends this year and i'm excited now with with lynn and ends teaming up to coach this defense i think you're going to see a defense that plays hard and plays smart and boy will that be nice to watch um as for who's left out and i assume the answer is brian odom uh, I, I don't know that we know the answer may be that everybody's left out and that there are a whole series of additional defensive coaches coming on board, right? That's a, that's a very real possibility. 
And I don't know if that's something that has to happen. I mean, some of the defensive coaches that are around are guys that, that, that Lincoln Riley may feel good about, and maybe for good reason. But if he also decides to, to, uh, to completely clean house, it would be hard to fault him on that as well. So uh, I don't think we know yet, but, <laughs> but I'm excited about this hire. I didn't expect it. When I saw it, I was thrilled. And, um, and, and I think you're going to see a huge difference defensively with USC next year. Well, I tell you, I will, uh, I will say this, uh, Lincoln Riley is backed into a corner. Okay. He's in a situation where he keeps talking about defense. Now he's got to get a staff to prove it. And I think it's all getting down to the pressure on Lincoln Riley to reestablish his own reputation that he can be accountable on both sides of the ball. I mean, if his long-range goal ever is to get to the NFL, he's got to change the perception. If he's going to recruit and recruit at a high level for a national championship, he's got to change the perception of defense at SC and his own perception of offense only. Uh, so why would a guy like Ants come to USC? First of all, Ants is following in the path of previous uh, North Dakota State uh, uh, coaches that were also highly successful. So he's been on the staff. He's seen what it's like. He's now participating as a head coach. So like Chris and the and and Mark and Eric have both said, you know, he he definitely knows what he's doing. Why would he come? Well, maybe he goes from three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year coach to maybe over a million plus uh, at USC. That would be a good incentive. I know he's got a couple of kids. I don't know what their ages are. Uh, ironically, I believe they're playing Montana this week in the semifinal. Oh, sorry, Greg, you go, I'm going to go back to you. His kids are are both in their second year in college. One of them is on the North Dakota State football team, a, a walk on wide receiver. Uh, the other one's a baseball player, I believe, at a at a community college. So both athletes and and both college age. Go ahead. Hey, that no, that's important to know because a lot of coaches don't want to move their family, especially if the kids are. Uh, in elementary or even in high school, for that matter. And I, what I was going to say is my understanding is that Montana also has the son of Trojan Athletic Director uh, uh, Jen there to uh, kind of as a uh, little bit sidebar story. So what you just said, Eric, is is interesting uh, that you would get uh, such a close to home with Ents in, the, in Montana uh, with Jen Cohen's son uh, playing at Montana. I think he's a freshman. But very interesting. I think that uh, the point where I think that that Lynn will be able to teach Ants some of the nuances of the NFL game, and and Ants can talk a little bit more to uh, uh, to Lynn about college games. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. I don't think they're done with changing the coaching staff. Now they can rearrange positions. They could take somebody who's maybe been a, an outside linebacker coach and move him to another position coach. But I don't think we're done yet. I'm not ready to speculate who it's going to be, uh, at least for publicly. Uh, so I apologize for that. But uh, sometimes you have to just zip it until uh, until it's more or less common knowledge. So it's going to be very interesting to watch this. Uh, I agree with all three of uh, my esteemed colleagues that this is a good hire. Uh, so it'll be fascinating to watch, especially when spring ball gets here. Fans, you ever been caught in the last minute ticket frenzy, the stress, uncertainty, it's crunch time. You don't need it, but guess what? There's a game changing solution. It's called game time. Imagine this effortless ticket buying for all your favorite sports, music, comedy, theater events. No more frantic searches. Game time is your ultimate ticket, buddy. That sure sounds good to me. Want some perks? Well, how about incredible deals on last minute tickets? And a rock-solid best price guarantee. Say goodbye to ticket anxiety. Hello to the sheer joy of being in the moment. The USC football regular season, of course, has been completed. And the Trojans are headed to DirecTV's San Diego Holiday Bowl for a date with F CFP number 15 Louisville Cardinals on Wednesday, December 27th at Petco Park. You can check out game time for the best ticket options for the Holiday Bowl. And a reminder, also check out game time for the best ticket values for USC basketball games at the Galen Center. So check out the game time tickets after watching or listening to today's Inside the Trojans Huddle. Aside from USC tickets, you can also head to game time for Rams, Chargers, Lakers, and Clippers, and tickets to all your favorite LA teams. And don't forget those concerts as well. Flash deals, easy access, seat 
View images, unbeatable best price guarantees, event protection. Game time has it all from sports to rock concerts. So here's the deal. Head to gametime.com, or excuse me, dot co, dot co. That's gametime.co, not dot com. Download the app, create an account, use Trojans code Tro Trojans for $20 off your first purchase. Ready to dive in? As for buying tickets, as easy as tapping on your phone. Tickets are sent straight to your phone. Again, download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Trojans for $20 off. Terms apply, create an account, redeem code Trojans for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, let's head into the second quarter. Another interesting uh, bit of information coming out now. Uh, Trojans are now in their holiday bowl practice schedule. And quarterback Miller Moss is understandably getting a lot of the early attention since Caleb Williams is not playing in the game and apparently headed to the NFL. Panel, what are your expectations for Miller Moss? What do you think the Trojans quarterback future is with rumors swirling that Washington State quarterback Cam Ward has the Trojans on his short list of potential transfer portal, portal destinations? We've also heard Ohio State. And we haven't even mentioned quarterback Will Howard of Kansas State who already has met with Lincoln Riley in Manhattan, Kansas. Overall, panel, how do you see this quarterback situation in general all playing out? That's a big task, but we'll start off with Chris Arledge. Where are we going in the quarterback situation here? Well, over the short term, uh, Miller Moss has a great opportunity to be a starting quarterback at USC and, and play in a nationally televised game. Um, it's a tough situation to be in because – when it comes to these bowl games, you never really know who's going to be playing or how motivated they're going to be. And he's playing against a, a defense that has some athletes, assuming those guys are playing. I mean, you never know. Um, and, so, uh, you know, Miller Moss is going to be playing in front of an offensive line that has not dominated this season. He doesn't have Caleb Williams' ability to move around. So uh, it's going to be a challenge, but I don't see any reason that that Miller can't play uh, can't play effectively in the Holiday Bowl, and and I hope he does. Long term, uh, Lincoln Riley does not talk to me about these sorts of things or really anything else. But I think it's highly unlikely Miller Moss is going to be USC starting quarterback next year. Um, he probably could do it and do it effectively, right? But the thing is that Lincoln Riley and USC are, are pretty attractive to uh, to really talented quarterbacks, right? They've seen what happens to, to the guys who transfer and play for Lincoln Riley. They tend to go to New York. They tend to go very high in the draft. They tend to start in the NFL. And so if you're a Cam Ward or Will Howard or who knows who else Lincoln has his eye on, um, you're going to think seriously about moving to USC. And if you're Lincoln Riley... You don't have to settle for a kid who is a hard worker and talented, but not elite. You don't have to because he can go and find somebody else and probably should because you're talking about the most important position on the field. And um, having, having an elite player at that position may win you one, two, three games that you're not going to win otherwise. And Lincoln Riley really needs to win some games next year. I mean, he needs to win in a bad way. So <laughs> unless, unless Riley strikes out on his transfer portal targets, I don't think that Miller Moss is going to be a starting quarterback at USC. He may decide to be one somewhere else, and I guess we'll see. I hope not. I mean, he's been at USC a long time. He may decide he'd rather, he'd rather stick it out, and, and I hope he does um, for a lot of reasons, including the USC could use a depth. But I also wouldn't fault Moss if he decided that uh, if a Cam Ward or Will Howard come in, that he needs to go somewhere else where he can play. That would make sense. Um, I don't think it's going to affect Malachi Nelson. I think um, a guy that comes in for one year shouldn't scare away a, uh, a redshirt freshman who himself badly wants to play for Lincoln Riley because he knows what that can do for him. Um, so I, I think this is probably the only time we'll see Miller Moss start a game as USC's quarterback. And, um, and, and I think USC fans are all very much wanting him to, to be a success, but I don't think we're going to see it anymore after, uh, after a couple of weeks from now. Mark, what do you think? What do you know? 
pretty bleak outlook for Miller Moss, according to the world of Chris Harledge. Um, <laughs> look, he's a redshirt sophomore. He didn't he didn't start that game at Cal up in Berkeley two years ago. He came in in the third quarter when Jackson Dart got I, he got he got injured, I believe, and he did well in considering the circumstances. And we know that was the end of the Clay Helton era with Dante Williams as the interim head coach. So he's got this opportunity in front of him, playing the Holiday Bowl, impress his head coach. And where I come, where I stand on this is, look, if Lincoln Riley is going to start playing the role of transfer portal quarterback, I'm only going to take a guy who's elite, who's ready to play for one year, Maybe we get a Heisman and maybe we can rely on that quarterback to carry us, you know, across the finish line. Well, didn't we just watch that movie this year? You know, long term, if, if Lincoln Riley continues to go that route where it's like, all right, I didn't recruit that guy and I'm not sure he can be that guy. And the guy I did recruit a five star, but he wasn't ready at the end of year one. That's going to start playing with the high school recruits. They're going to notice that trend that, you know what, Lincoln Riley and USC is willing to pay a million bucks to get a guy for a, for a year, whatever the going rate is, because you know they're going, to pay, they're going to have to pay for him as well. I don't know if that's how you want to establish a culture at your program. Like I said, look, we, we saw what happens when you rely on one player to be your offense. You end up with, a, what, a 7-5 and five record. Miller Moss might be the answer. If defense is going to be priority number one for USC going forward, you don't need to have that elite quarterback. Have somebody who's talented and skilled enough to do the job, which Lincoln Riley has said multiple and numerous times. Let him be that guy. Let him be the game manager, if you want to use it. Let him use his skilled players. Let him be another Matt Liner. I mean, that 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 formula seemed to work pretty well for Pete Carroll. Have a really good quarterback put up a pretty good offensive line in front of him, elite skill players, and a really damn good defense. I like those results. That That's one vote for Miller Moss as the next Matt Liner. I'm saying you got to give him the opportunity, right? He was good enough to want to – look, if CIF didn't get involved, he would have been modern days – uh, quarterback all right eric what do you what do you think i think there's there's what i'd like to see happen and what i think is probably going to happen and what i'd like to see happen is miller moss be the quarterback at usc next year and and get the shot that i think he's probably earned and deserved and what i think is going to happen is they're going to end up with will howard and he's going to be really good in Lincoln Riley's system at a potential first round pick and a potential Heisman Trophy winner. And that's what Lincoln Riley does with his quarterbacks. I, I think it's nice to say, you know, well, you can put things around him and you can do whatever, but you want, you want the best guy you can get at quarterback. And I think especially for next year, you want a guy who's kind of kind of been in the action before this this is not the easiest schedule to kind of waltz into without a bunch of experience uh and there's guys out there in the portal that have it um the idea that you know you're messing with culture and bringing in transfer quarterbacks they all are they all are the top 10 quarterbacks of like the last six years in the recruiting class there's like five of them they're still at the class, at the, the school that they sign with. It's what it is now. Guys leave. They leave and they transfer and it's college football the the way it works now at that position. Uh the Heisman Trophy winner last year was a transfer quarterback. The Heisman Trophy winner this year was a transfer quarterback. There's going to be guys in the playoff that are all transfer quarterbacks. I mean it, it's it's how it is. Um, guys guys want to play right now, and you can go get guys like that that don't mess up the the um the locker room when they do it. Michael Penix is is beloved at Washington. Bo Nix is beloved at Oregon. You can do that kind of stuff. Again, that being said, do I think Miller Moss would fall flat and absolutely embarrass himself next year if he was the quarterback? No, 
no, he, he wouldn't, he's not, he's the type of guy that will do what you need him to do. I don't think we're going to find out if he can, because I don't think USC can sit around and not go get a guy and wait until the 27th and into deep December to say, Oh, he did really well in that game. My assumption is if they go in the transfer portal, they're going to have to, they're going to have to get a guy committed well before that game. And since you can't, since you can't wait, it's not really going to matter. I think what, what Miller does uh, in that game, because you don't bring in a transfer portal guy to, you know, compete and, and see how things go again, talking, talking down two paths, what I'd like to see happen and, and what, if I had to bet on it, what I think is going to happen. Uh, and and that's kind of the, the way I'd read things right now. Again, you're running the risk of, you're not going to need one out of the portal. You're going to need two because you got Juju Lewis, apparently who is supposed to be the next guy in line behind Malachi Nelson. All of a sudden now Malachi doesn't have that buffer anymore especially if Juju reclassifies. So I, I think Lincoln Riley's just. But Malachi, I mean, are you, are you saying Malachi would like if Miller's the quarterback next year okay. or a transfer is the quarterback next year, Malachi is still not the quarterback next year. But we're all saying, we're all suggesting that if you bring in a Will Howard or a Cam Ward, Miller's leaving, right? So now you're going to go, now you're going with, Cam maybe or now you're going with Cam Ward or Will Howard. We assume if Miller's not going to be the starting quarterback, he's going to leave. So if Mil- if Malachi Nelson isn't ready now to be Lincoln Riley's guy, what happens if that transfer gets hurt? Is Jake Jensen going to be the guy? You're you're just I, I think you're playing with fire. Okay? Mark, you don't you don't settle <laughs> at the most important position on the field. Lincoln Riley has four straight transfer quarterbacks, and all four of them absolutely killed it in college football. It's going well, to be five quarterbacks. He can only use transfers because he recruited Spencer Rattler. How'd that work out? He's recruited Malachi Nelson. We're not sure how that one's working out. I don't care. Okay. But, but and it nor should you. The answer is I don't care. Look around college football. Look around college football and look at how many of the elite quarterbacks are transfers. It happens all over the place. He was at LSU before he finally won the Heisman with three losses, mind you. Yeah. He was a transfer. Notre Dame had a transfer. Two years ago? What's that? Two years ago, right? It's not like he was a one and done, you know, ringer hire. I okay. I'm not sure what you're going with right now. Here's what we know. It's the most important position on the field. Lincoln Riley will consistently have access to the best guys, the best high school recruits, but also the best transfers. Every other program he's competing with is going to the transfer portal for quarterbacks. It happens with all of the major programs. The idea that Lincoln Riley should say, well, I could get a better guy, but I'm not going to because I'm going to play really good defense next year, (laughs) strikes me as nuts, especially in light of Lincoln's history of playing defense. The really good programs right now, is Michigan bringing in transfer portal quarterbacks? Is Georgia? Is Alabama? Yeah, I, I, Alabama did bring in a transfer no. quarterback. The answer is no. Alabama did bring in a transfer quarterback. Ohio they State brought in the brought Notre in Dame. They brought in uh, Ty Booker, Butcher. He's playing lacrosse now somewhere, I believe. Yeah. But no, they did bring him in. Alabama did bring him in, for the record. I, I think point being is that that's not their norm. Alabama, uh, Alabama brings in transfers where they where they can make an upgrade on their roster. They do, then they'll do it at every position on the field. So will Georgia. Georgia brings in transfers. Now those two programs don't have a lot of holes in their roster, but they will bring in transfers and they will start them and they will do it at the most important positions and they will do it because both of those coaches want to have the very best rosters they can have, and that's what USC needs to have. I mean, the idea that USC would have been better off if they didn't take Caleb Williams, you said, we saw what happens. Yeah, but what if they didn't have Caleb? Can you imagine had that Caleb defense with a lesser quarterback? Had Caleb this year, and they actually regressed because they relied on him so much. I, I don't think it's because he was a transfer. I think it's because they had gigantic problems elsewhere on the roster. The reality is that you, if you're going to compete at the highest level, 
You have to go get the best guys you can, especially at the most important position. I would like to draw a, a line on the sand. Is when we knew we were getting Caleb for one and for for the second year. I I would like to draw a line on the sand where you're not going for one and done type of players. I think that's where I'm standing right now. I agree with Mark. That's where I, I think Lincoln Riley's starting to go. Because Caleb Williams kind of played like a one and done this year. Caleb Williams wasn't a one and done, but he played like it this year. I don't even know what that means. He had a tough. Well, I don't know. Why, a tough offensive to, we, haven't, line. we haven't talked to him in a month. He has a problem talking to the media when he doesn't win. Would Notre Dame have been better off if they didn't go and get Hartman, but they played with the guys they had on the roster because they don't want to one and done? It didn't seem like be that much different. Well, I don't know. They threw the ball okay. So I mean, they look, for him. this is against this is, USC. At least against USC, he did. You're asking, you're asking Lincoln Riley not to do what's been wildly successful for him his entire career and something that everybody else in college football is doing. You're asking him to pass on the better player at the most important position. I'm saying we have to be careful with it, Chris. I'm not I, I'm not 100% on anything. I'm saying if this is the direction. You just drew a line in the sand, Mark. Come on now. I, 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 <laughs> one, one and done quarterbacks. Let's, 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 All let's right. Go. We take a timeout on the court. Um, I think that Lincoln Riley, I do believe, is getting caught in this one and done deal with one year quarterbacks. He's had six, some success, no question about it. But the overall issue to me is what it does to his current roster. First of all, I think Miller Moss deserves to play. He has been a good, loyal backup. He would have started in a number of programs, no question about it. He has said, even said it uh, during the week, you know, I'm willing to compete. I'm not worried about anybody coming in. The problem is, is guys coming in, like whether it's Howard or it's Ward, they're not coming in to sit either. And, you know, there's there's going to be – the deck is stacked as far as I'm concerned when one of these guys comes in. Now, the bottom line is winning. But I think that that uh, Lincoln Riley is under such pressure and heat going into his third year in a with a schedule that's really a murderer's row where you open up with LSU, you end with Notre Dame, and in between, oh, by the way, there's a Big Ten schedule, you know, that also includes uh, Wisconsin – or excuse me, uh, Michigan and, uh, you know, Penn State, you got a lot of, when it comes to wins and losses, you are really challenged. Now, my big uh, fear is, and I think Mark brought it up, and I think Eric touched on it, was the idea of what message does it send to high school quarterbacks when they see all the change that can happen if they come to SC. Now, maybe it's just the game that we have today, but, you know, I'm looking at Malachi Nelson. Where is he going to go? Uh, and you know, in the future, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, Juju Lewis from Florida, the, you know, the five-star quarterback, well, heck he committed. And what did he do uh, recently? He goes and visits Ohio state. So there is so much in the air that the only thing that's, that's certain is that there's uncertainty and what happens if both Miller Moss and Malachi Nelson both say the hell with it all. I'm going somewhere else. And there, then what you're stuck with a one-year quarterback. You know, this idea, well, I'll just go out and get another one-year quarterback. I, I don't think you can sustain that. I think that, that Riley's been very fortunate getting away with it, and I don't mean that in a negative way getting away with it, but he's been he's been able to do it. Let's put it that way. Whether he can sustain it, that's another question. So but, Hold on this, a second, Greg. Hold on a second. So you're saying that Miller Moss is the guy to take us through that schedule next year. And that's based on what exactly? I think he deserves no, I think he's I think he deserves a chance. What does that mean? Deserves a chance. You're gonna pass on guys in the portal because he's been a good trooper and he's practiced hard? Which no, we assume he's all. practiced hard. We actually don't get to see you're, those. You're begging the question. Well, no, but that's the exactly bottom the line is the bottom line is he deserves a fair shake. That's all I'm saying. He de deserves a fair shake in spring ball if he's the guy. He should start. I don't care about Cam Ward. I don't care about uh, Howard. If if he, Miller Moss, and I'm speaking as a former coach now, okay, I think that if you're going to say that we're going to have competition, it's got to be fair competition. Maybe it doesn't turn out that Ward uh, is the guy. Uh, but I, all I'm saying on behalf of Miller Moss is I would like it to be fair competition. I will be honest with you. There wasn't really fair competition even when Pete Carroll was here. He knew who he wanted, no matter how well other players played. 
It's who Pete wanted. Even if the other coaches said he's not the best guy coming from a position coach, Pete did whatever Pete wanted to do. And all I'm saying with Miller Moss, nothing more, nothing less, give the guy an honest shot in spring. If he can do it, I have no problem next year. But I'm not so sure he gets a fair shot. That's just my opinion. Lincoln uh, Riley Lincoln Riley has watched Miller Moss in practice for the last two years. He knows what he has with Miller Moss. Does he? Of course he does. He's watching. How, how does he know that? Some, some guys are – they they right, practice right, let's give, well. Let's give, let's let me finish. The the Some guys practice well in practice, Come but they on. really light they up. Can, in the Lincoln game. Riley's a quarterbacks expert. You're saying he's watched this guy for the last two years in practice, but he's not sure what he's got. He knows exactly what he's got. If he goes out and grabs a Cam Ward, there's a reason, Greg. There's a reason. Yeah, I think there is a reason. Uh, I think he's backed into a corner and he really is nervous about going off. He can't have another seven and six year next year. He better not. Well, he, he better, better not. not. You're and right. He better he, not. And that means he can't make being nice to Miller Moss. His one it's not priority. a question. That you're, you're missing the point. No, Which, I understand the, the point. No, no, you're missing the point. The point is give Miller Moss an honest ability to compete in the spring. Let him start if he's the starter against LSU. Let him play himself out of the position or what have you. But Lincoln Riley uh, could make the argument, I don't have a lot of time to develop a quarterback with that schedule and having coming off a potential seven and six year. I'm not saying they're going to lose to Louisville, but if they did, uh, he he can't afford – he doesn't have a lot of uh, slack. That's how, that's how I look at it. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Mark. You want to end up with something he's here? Go ahead. He's got a great stage in two weeks. Right? That he's going to have a really good, fair opportunity to show his wares. So exactly, exactly, and that's all I'm saying. Give the kid the opportunity to show what he can do. And remember, he's going to be behind an offensive line that probably, uh, you know, I <laughs> could make it quite happy feet in the in the backfield. That's what I would say. Uh, okay, well, let's move on here, guys. Um, we're going to take a look here at halftime and uh, halftime means that we're going to take a look uh, on the heels of the first quarter discussion a little bit. This NCAA transfer portal is wide open for business. Trojans future roster is being affected as we speak. The official list, at least up to what I have, please add names. If you, if I leave somebody off of this uh, USC players who have gone into the portal, uh, most of it's public knowledge, uh, uh, here's what we know of players that have left or have gone into the portal, by the way. Uh, quick list here. Wide receiver, Michael Jackson the third, Defensive lineman, Dijon Benton. Wide receiver, uh, running back, uh, Rayleigh Brown. Linebacker, Chris Thompson Jr. Tight end, Jude Wolf. Safety, Marion Gordon. Running back, Darwin Barlow. Running back, Matt Colombo. And defensive lineman, Jamar Sakona. Panel, of the known USC players listed above as transferring out, which player or players do you wish had stayed and why, Eric? So I, I would have liked to have seen really Brown kind of unleashed uh, in this offense with the other guys that are there. I mean, I, I'd say Michael Jackson, the third, absolutely. But I don't know if he was ever going to get kind of a, a fair shot. I mean, he was here and, seem to do everything that he could. So again, if it's, if it's keeping them on the roster and also getting them on the field, then I, I think he's my guy. And then staying on offense, I Darwin Barlow sure seems like a guy who could have carried the ball quite a bit for you. There, there's a, when you have two young Texas running backs in there and a third guy from Texas coming in Barlow's that kind of another Texas guy who could be kind of the vet um, for all those young guys. He, he struck me as a guy who could have tied that room together uh, a little bit as, as a vet um, next year. So, so those are the, those are kind of the, the clear guys for me, all, all offensive Um all offensive players. All right, Chris, who would you like to keep? Yeah, same names. Uh, and, and Barlow is also a guy. I don't know why Darwin Barlow never played. 
I don't know, right? We don't get to see practices. We don't get to see uh, what's going on in the meeting rooms. We don't get to see what's going on in the weight room. I have no idea. There are all kinds of reasons why, why guys who are talented may not get on the field because the coaches don't think they're doing something they should be doing. And I can't speak to that. All I can say is every time the guy was on the field, he looked awfully good. And, and you're talking about a situation where USC doesn't have a lot of experience at running back. They don't have a lot of depth at running back uh next year that i can see so i think that's um i think that's a disappointment because i uh, i really liked i really liked what we saw from him and i wanted to see him play i agree with with michael jackson and ray league brown i think they're both good players and they'll be good somewhere else it's also the case that if if ray leak is a slot receiver um usc is not going to have problems at wide receiver they're just not the class they brought in last year is absurdly talented and those guys are going to be ready to play a lot. And they're probably uh, as as talented as Jackson and Brown are. I think the the guys they brought in last year are probably more talented than they are. And, and, and USC is always going to be able to recruit uh, wide receivers, whether it's a portal or from the high school ranks. So um, I'm sorry to see those guys go, but I don't know that we'll miss them the same way I think we could miss Darwin Barlow. Mark? Yeah. So with, with Rayleigh Brown, the reason he's leaving is he, he kind of said it. He, he's a running back who can play wide receiver. Uh, so you would hope that, you know, Lincoln Riley and the offensive staff would have been able to find a way to incorporate Rayleigh Brown's unique skill set into their offensive identity, who might, you know, whatever they're doing. Michael Jackson, the third, you know, not only is he a, a, a really good receiver, but he also is a, he can play on special teams. Um, he had a punt return for a touchdown until that was a uh, callback. But uh, those are the first two because they they've shown that they can be productive on the field. I was I'm still surprised that even though Lake McCree uh, gets a lot of action, that tight end position hasn't been fully utilized um, in the first two years. So again, Jude Wolf, another offensive player. You guys have already spoken about Darwin Barlow. Um, the reason why he didn't play, because we don't get to see practice, is because they brought in a couple of transfers. So, again, it, that's, I guess, where I was going with this, Chris, is it gets to a point where certain players might have put in their time, have shown that when you put them on the field, they can do the job. But because of... He was also a transfer, Mark. Yeah, but how long has he been there, Chris? It's, I'm not talking about one-year transfers. These well, guys, hey, hey, listen. The one-year transfer, the one-year, the one-year transfer we had a running back this year, and the one-year transfer we had a running back last year. Those guys were invaluable, right? Those were fantastic football players. Absolutely. Those were two one. Travis, Travis died. <laughs> Travis die is a one and done that even you should feel good about, right? I, I mean, that was fantastic. I, I, Chris, you're not going to get one percentage of, of disagreement from you on that. What I would say is that I would hope that Darwin Barlow learned a thing or two from each of those guys. So it, for me, especially at running back, you want, Eric touched on it, the veteran leadership is something that's going to be missing from this room until they bring in somebody from the transfer portal. And you have that Texas connection. Now, whether or not Darwin was going to get playing time over Quentin Joyner and Marion Peterson because the staff did not recruit him. That's probably what played into um, Darwin's decision to, you know what, I put in my time. I don't feel it. It's not vibing. It's time for me to move on. We all wish he would stay. Defensively, look, maybe Dejon Benton. But off, off that list, that's it. Well, I tell you, I... Uh... I, I think Mark brought up this point, and obviously people who watch this show or read what I write on WeRC.com, I I really, really think it's an injustice that the media cannot watch practice. I don't care what Lincoln Riley really feels about it, but he should want us to watch it because we can back him up and, and point out things of why uh, a player would transfer out. Like you guys, every time I saw Barlow in there, he delivered. 
He delivered some big touchdown runs. I don't know what the consistency pattern is or what their philosophy is. Now, maybe they could sit there and say, well, if you were in practice, you'd see that he fumbles all the time. If you were in practice, you'd see he doesn't work hard all the time. But we're not in practice. So we're left to watch what we see in the games like everybody else and come to our own conclusions. But I think the problem is, is that when you see like a guy like Rayleigh Brown, let's say, look, when he was being moved to wide receiver, I told all my little uh, buddies, it's over for him. They're moving him out. He's a he's a running back who, as it was pointed out here, can catch the ball. Uh, if he goes to Oregon, uh, which wouldn't shock me, and lights it up, that won't shock me. It gets back to what is the philosophy of the running game, okay? If you got a lousy offensive line, we can understand that backs aren't producing because they can't get through the hole. But some of the backs they've had, Barlow included, were able to work around it and be productive. Um, I kind of felt bad for Jude Wolf a little bit because he'd been hurt so much. And now he seemed like he was getting healthy. He actually caught a touchdown pass. Uh, I can understand why the others left. I was very disappointed with Michael Jackson, the third leaving. I don't know what the problem it was with him, whether, whether it was him and he wanted more playing time or what have you. But I think, again, if I'm in practice, I have a much better perspective of why he was or wasn't playing and, and brought himself to the point where he says, I'm out of here. So we'll have to see. Are they the last guys in the portal? I don't know. Obviously, you know, guys could come out of spring practice and say, okay, I'm not staying. Uh, but the one thing I do know is when they bring somebody else in from the portal, they're not bringing them in to sit on the bench. They're going to get preference on, especially if, if the tie goes to the runner, the tie in a position to me is going to probably go to the portal transfer. So with that, a reminder, USC football fans, following the conclusion of each and every USC home and away game, including the Holiday Bowl. We RSC brings you five things, a timely post-game analysis from moderator and We RSC editor-in-chief Eric McKenney, along with columnist uh, Mark Culkin and myself. Uh, the Holiday Bowl coming up December 27th, not uh, long after the end of that game, we'll present to you five things, our perspective on the game. And friends, again, we strongly encourage those of you watching inside the Trojan Huddle on sites like YouTube, Click the like and red subscriber buttons. It's greatly valued. It's free. And you can also, again, listen to Inside the Trojans Huddle on many available podcast sites. Be sure to check out wrsc.com and become a premium subscriber. All right, third quarter. It's time for the Big Ten Lightning Round predictions. Time for the Big Ten Lightning Round predictions, which means the panel will respond to the following 10 questions with quick responses. We'll go in this order. Mark, Eric. Chris and myself. So here we go. Question one, yes or no. There will be a former UCLA defensive player transferring to USC because of USC's new defensive coordinator, Danton Lynn, formerly the DC at UCLA. Are the Trojans going to get some UCLA transfers? Mark Oaken, yes or no? Yes. All right. Eric. Uh, yeah. So initially you asked singular and then you asked plural. So well, I'll also take it either way. So, we'll find yeah, so, so yes, singular. Okay. Chris. These guys both know more about recruiting than I do, so I'm going to say yes, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes as well. Question two, yes or no? Recently, USC five-star quarterback commit Julian Juju Lewis, class of 2026, made a recruiting trip to Ohio State. Do you think that Lewis's USC commitment will hold over time? Mark Culkin. What year is he coming in, Eric? Uh, right now, he's a 2026 guy. No, I mean, maybe if 25. He, okay, if Mark. He yes. If he reclassifies, yes. If he's 2026, no. Okay, well done, Eric. Uh, I don't think any quarterbacks anything will hold ever unless he is walking out the tunnel in uniform to take a snap in the season opener. That's when I believe a quarterback will suit up for that program. Chris. Yeah, I I'm going to say yes, but I I'm, I'm sort of with Eric on this. Even if he shows up on campus, you don't know how long he'll be there because 
uh, as we've already talked about in major college football, quarterbacks are, uh, it's a game of musical chairs. They bounce around. So I think he'll, I think he'll be there, but who knows? All right. Jake. I did, look, this is, this is Monday. Dylan Rayola is getting kind of, predictions and and flips to nebraska at this point i mean it's the the idea that anybody knows what any quarterback is going to do an hour from now two days from now three years from now is uh is, is going out on a limb who's who's ohio state's quarterback right now by the way does anybody know i don't think they know didn't, didn't the quarterback transfer out into the portal i, I raised the question I don't think there's an answer. I can't give an answer. Can you guys give an answer? Any Buckeye fans give an answer? I will. I will say this: if it's 2026 with Juju, I will say no. He will not be a Trojan. If he gets reclassified 2025, I think there's a strong chance he will. I always laugh when they say, uh, "I'm committed now. I'm going to go and recruit as many high school buddies as I can, be part of our great class." And then down the line, they make a commitment somewhere else. And you go, what happened to all your buddies? You know. <laughs> all right, question three. Who is the bigger Big Ten recruiting threat to USC going forward? Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Washington, Oregon, or UCLA? That's a big group, but who's the biggest threat, Mark? You make me say it. Oregon. Eric? Yeah, it's Oregon. Because they're, they're the one school in that that takes pride in – looking at the USC recruiting class and saying, let's go get that specific guy. <laughs> oh boy. Chris. Yeah, it's Oregon. I mean, Ohio state will pull guys out of Southern California, but they recruit nationally. Oregon recruits the West coast for the most part. And, um, and right now you right now, Oregon is like the Yankees and USC is like the Oakland A's. They have all the money and, uh, and USC <laughs> is trying to figure out where they can find value. Well, I'm sorry to say that it's Oregon. And uh, until SE proves that they're balanced on both sides of the ball, it's still going to be Oregon. And that's a tough one to swallow. Question four, yes or no, if you could bring one defensive player back from USC's past to play in 2024, who would it be, Mark Culkin? Just one? Just one. Junior say out that, that, that there is no wrong answer on this panel. I guarantee it. <laughs> That's why we did the question, Eric. I I think Leonard Williams. I mean, it's a it's a guy in the middle that can give you some pass rush too. I, I think it's I think it's him for me. The look if I could put the wild bunch as one guy, then uh, then then it'd be that. Wild bunch two or one, and all of them. Yes. Re- reading the de- details, details, details. Chris, who are you bringing back? So my answer is always Junior Seau, but since Mark already said that, I'm going to go with Mike Patterson. Having Mike Patterson in the interior would just be difference-making next year. All right. The player I would bring back, one player, Chris Claiborne in the middle. I think Chris Claiborne could control a game like nobody I've seen at USC from sideline to sideline. Uh, he was unbelievable. The only, I think, Butkus Award winner in the school's history. He would be the guy I would pick. Question five, yes or no? Do you agree that LSU quarterback Jaden Daniels should have been named the 2023 Heisman Trophy winner? Mark? No. Eric? That, I, that's way too long of a pause. No, absolutely not. Michael Penix should have won and won by a lot. Chris? Yeah, I also think Penix should have won, but I was afraid that the West Coast vote would be split up with the two quarterbacks and that would happen. Yeah, I, I don't think that he should, that Daniels, although I'm happy he's a Southern California kid, got it, but I don't think he was the man. I think this was another East Coast, Southwest, Southeast Conference uh ballot boxing stuffing things uh, in there for Daniels question six looking at the Trojans 2024 big 10 schedule away game Michigan Minnesota Maryland Washington UCLA aside from Michigan and UCLA which takes us down to just three which game would you like to attend Mark Culkin pick one 
That would be Minnesota, Maryland, and Washington. Thank you. Um, I'll go Minnesota. Minnesota? Okay, Eric. Washington. Chris. All right, well, then I'll go Maryland. And I do like going to D.C., but uh, I'm not sure that I really want to watch a Terrebonne's football game. Yeah, and I was originally going to say uh, Maryland because of the D.C. connection. I love going to Washington, D.C. but I th And I've been to Minnesota. It's a nice little stadium that they, they built the last time SC was there. Uh, over, I was not impressed by the Mall of America. Uh, it's just like the South Coast Plaza at five levels. So I would go to Washington. I think it's a much nicer trip, and I think the competition will be stiff. Question seven, yes or no? Will USC play any football games in 2024 that will kick off at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time? Mark. They got Utah State on the schedule, right? Yeah. Yeah. The answer is yes. Uh, I painfully have to agree with you. Eric? I think so. Chris? Yep. I agree. I think it's going to be Utah State at 7.30 Question eight, yes or no, in the Holiday Bowl, will USC still be wearing a Pac-12 logo patch on the front of their jersey? Yes or no, Mark? Hmm, I consider it. You know what? Yes. Eric? Yeah, USC is still in the Pac-12 until, what, August of, of 24, right? I mean, the basketball teams are all still wearing it. Chris? Yeah, the answer is yes. They're still the Pac-12, and they're the Pac-12 rep in that bowl game. I agree, yes. Question nine, yes or no, at this time of next year, Reggie Bush will have received his Heisman Trophy back. Yes or no, Mark? Better. Eric? No, it's it's no until it happens. I, I don't ever think it's – I don't ever think any of these people are going to get on the same page with this. Chris? Yeah, I – if you would have asked me this question last year at this time, I would have said yes. But now I'm going to say no. It's just dragged on too long for no good reason. And I'm going to say uh, no, he will not. All right, question 10, the bonus question. Guys, you got to make a choice here. Birthday parties, wedding receptions, or bachelor parties? Mark? Yeah, just see. It's bachelor parties. <laughs> Shocking. Eric? Uh, wedding receptions. Oh, all right. I don't know. I, I people can't get organized enough to bring cake uh, to to bachelor parties. <laughs> it's always about pie at bachelor parties, Eric. I guess. <laughs> oh, that's a bad one. <laughs> it's always about the girl. <laughs> I said, uh, Chris, I know what you're going to say, Chris. I can almost bet on it. You can. I'm curious because I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I don't want. Look, I don't want to go to any of them. I never want to go to any of them. If I, it, I'll socialize if I have to, but it's not by choice. So, um, if I have to pick one, I'll go. Uh, I'll go birthday parties. I can leave earlier. <laughs> All right. I guess the teenager in me never leaves. I'm for the bachelor party. <laughs> For all the obvious reasons, if you've been to a bachelor party. All right, let's move on here. It's time to get ready for the third quarter, uh, excuse me, fourth quarter, but as we traditionally do here on the huddle, we light the symbolic Coliseum torch. There's the candle. And by the way, happy Hanukkah to all of our Jewish friends. Uh, so here we are, a tribute to USC home games when the famed Coliseum torch is lit between the third and fourth quarter of every home game. And while this torch burns, a reminder to all of you recruitaholics, don't forget to watch WeRSC.com's weekly recruiting video show, Recruiting Roundup, with nationally respected Scott Schrader, best in the business, and outstanding host Dylan Brazier. And remember, as well, to watch Friday's Four Down show with moderator Eric McKenney along with myself, bringing you the latest information on USC's next opponent. Uh, that would be, of course, uh, coming up the Louisville Cardinals. And this is all sponsored by Prize Pick. So with that business out of the way, it's time for the fourth quarter. Time to answer viewer questions from the WeRSC Members Premium Message Board. This is an open forum, so panel, feel free to jump in right with your answers. So question one. 
from SC Fan in South Florida. Hey, guys, always look forward to your views and comments each Tuesday. Question, how much do you expect Coach Riley to play the young offensive lineman? Noah, uh, Telly, uh, Raymond, Page, et cetera, in the Holiday Bowl to evaluate their growth this year. And how many veteran interior linemen do you think he will recruit from the portal going into the 24 season? Thanks, and thank you, SC fan, for the question. So, guys, what's happening here? I think we're going to see quite a bit of the young guys uh, in this one. Uh, I think especially uh, Eli Noah and uh, Elijah Page. Elijah Page has come up multiple times. Look at Riley just sort of brought him up. Uh, Miller Moss brought him up as a guy who's done really well uh, during practices. Whenever guys start talking specifically about young guys playing really well in practice, it certainly makes me think that they're seeing a lot of time in practice. And so my assumption is a, a couple of those guys could play could play quite a bit. I think for linemen, you need you need at least one and and maybe a couple uh, in this one. I, I think. You know, Emmanuel Pregnant is is around again. You've got some youth there, but I think offensive line is one of those spots where every year, every year in the portal, every year, bring bring in at least one guy just to kind of add to to whatever you have up there. Cause you can't get caught young there and you you can't get caught uh without numbers there. Yeah. Yeah. Lincoln Riley, he 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 started talking about it. During that Monday Zoom call last week, he mentioned Elijah Page. He mentioned Alani Noah. Those guys played early in the season. I, I anticipate seeing them in this bowl game. I actually anticipate seeing a lot of those freshmen because um, I don't know how long you're you know you're going to expose the Justin Dedicks of the world you know in this type of in this type of environment. So um, yeah, you're going to see a lot of the younger guys. The one thing about and I agree with Eric, you're going to have to bring somebody in through the transfer portal, but you, you can't miss. I mean, especially if you're going to be relying on these young guys starting next year. And there, there's five of them that they literally can, th they can roll out a freshman, redshirt freshman offensive line next year as your starters. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but theoretically it could. So we'll, well see. Well, you could miss you. So, so it's different year to year. I'm with like, they couldn't miss this year and they, they kind of did. Right. And you saw what happened. Like Bobby Haskins was, fine but i think the expectation was more but because that line was as veteran as it was you could piece together still a, a pretty good line even though maybe you missed with him this year that line was not set up to give you a soft landing if you missed next year maybe those guys can and if you miss it's not it's not quite the hard landing Without it, but but you're right. I mean, if you you can't miss anywhere in the portal when you go for a a veteran plug and play guy because that gives you that uh, just creates two holes because you still have that hole and you didn't bring in someone somewhere else and so that hole is still there. So it just it it compounds itself so quickly uh, when when you miss there. I mean, next year's offensive line right now you could see it as you got Elijah Page as your starting left tackle. Mason Murphy is your starting right tackle. You put Jonah Monheim back inside where he belongs, whether it's going to be at center or at one of the guard positions. But you're like Eric said, you're bringing back Emmanuel Prignon. Hopefully, Gino Quinones is healthy at the start of the season. You've got the depth there. A lot of it's young. So again, when you're if you're going to go to the portal, as Eric said, don't miss. Go get that one veteran guy. That if you need them to plug in right away and play, it's a sure thing. You can't have a repeat of Prignon getting better as the season goes along and Michael Tarquin sitting on the bench as the season goes along. You just can't have that. And then you have that one guy who never showed up. Well, I, I take the, the word uh, of Lincoln Riley. Uh, again, it gets down to credibility. He did say these freshmen are ready to go right now. And to me, my interpretation of right now means holiday bowl. So we'll we'll see how many actually do get to play. Thank you, uh, SC fan in South Florida. Appreciate the question. Question two from Romy, a standard here in Huntington Beach. Does the panel feel that dipping into the transfer portal as often as USC does 
erodes the high school recruiting environment. What say you? I don't think we've talked about that this episode. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to hear what Mark thinks about uh, one and done guys. No, look, <laughs> USC doesn't want to have to pull in 12 guys out of the portal in an offseason. They don't. But they don't have the roster that would allow them not to do it yet. So, and and let's be honest, the way USC is recruiting from the high school ranks right now is not as a top five elite program. So they're going to have to continue to do this for some time. All right, question three from Nelson and Natty, 2024, or Nissan Nelson from Natty, 2024. How many defensive tackles from the portal should USC get, considering Bear is the only D tackle they returned that played any time last season? Anybody got a number? I'd like four. Wow, four, okay. I didn't say they're going to get that many. I'd like that many. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, just a couple. Yeah, you, you you have to you have to get a few that can that can step in and play. I mean, which also makes the Dijon Benton transfer thing all that stranger, right? Especially because he's a guy that flashed from time to time. I thought he's quick for a big guy. He might be able to turn into something. It's it's weird that he would leave when it it looks like there's spots wide open for him to play. All right. Thank you, Natty. 2024. Question four from RC Trojans in Rancho Cucamonga. Since SC has only signed a LS in the portal so far, uh, which positions are your top three priorities as of now in the transfer portal? I realize things could change based on the current Trojans entering the portal or declaring for the draft. Okay. Which positions are your top three priorities as of now in the transfer portal? Well, Mark wants three quarterbacks. I don't think they need that many. I, I think, I think three is too much. Uh, no, they they need they need so so since this question right, they landed the the Vanderbilt Nate Clifton, the the defensive lineman from Vanderbilt. Hank Pepper is the the long snapper from Michigan State. So those are the two that are in so far. But but defensive line, defensive line, and then offensive line. I think you need a running back at this point. Um, gets mixed in there too. You need a linebacker and a linebacker, yeah. And I don't. I I think you could add another right. What what Makai Blackman gave you at corner, and Christian Roland Wallace gave you at corner. I I think. I think another guy out there too. So, yeah, top three. You can say what you want. There's about six positions I think where you have to get have to get somebody. All right, uh, let's move on to question number five from Trojans fan in the Valley. Panel, what player or players do you feel would be a quote-unquote must-gets from the transfer portal? I think he's probably talking in uh, terms of names. Any name out there that you are aware of that uh, would be what you consider a must-get panel? It's There really isn't... Um... Her name? Just the number one defensive tackle in the country. Whoever goes in. Whoever it is, that's the guy. Who the guy you're gonna put right next to Bear Alexander every snap. It's uh, right. So so if you could give anybody, Walter Nolan's the guy from, from Texas AM. He's not he's not coming to USC. I mean, it, it's it's you know, you can say I want all these guys, I, I want all this stuff. There's just Certain guys are going to drive uh, a price that USC is not going not going to meet. So if he's your if he's your must get in terms of a talent, that's the guy I'd list. But I wouldn't say you can't list him as you know if USC doesn't get him, it's a complete failure because there's just times where where things don't work out. They don't get set up, but there really aren't a lot of interior linemen in there right now that look like, you know, big time USC leans or or anything like that. Upton Stout is a, is a corner. Um, again, I, I just talked about corner kind of being a spot that, that you may want to add from Western Kentucky, I think would be a pretty solid addition here. And then there's some, um, some running backs have gone into, 
uh, I think that are that are kind of interesting guys. But they're really, you know, there's there's not a Caleb Williams, there's not a Jordan Addison. There 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 aren't those guys seemingly yet. But there's still there's still a lot of time for guys to go in. Yeah, I I you know all good points. I would uh, say a must get would have been Walter Nolan, uh, big time five star recruit, Texas A and M. I'm out of here. Uh, but I think this was always the fear of SC when Oregon was admitted to the Big Ten. Uh, I think there was that fear that they were going to play with ground rules different than what SC would say, and SC would come up short. And if Nolan ends up going to uh, to Oregon, I think it would be two factors. One, obviously, the, the NIL money that he would get, and two, Let's uh, let's be honest. The head coach of Oregon's a defensive guy from Georgia. You know, if, if you're on that side of the ball, that's that's a pretty hard deal to turn down money and the head coach that's on the defensive end, the defensive side of the ball. So that's a tough one for USC to battle. Uh, question six for B. Davis, seven eleven in Newport Coast, California. Panel with the season wrapping up and Greg's internet probably about to die. Oh, don't be 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 positive. What is the biggest positive takeaway you have from the season that was and the biggest negative? Oh, and Chris, you got to love another season where the puddle ducks don't win anything of consequences. No champs, no Heisman. Thanks and fight on. All right. So the question B Davis, 7-Eleven, Newport Coast. Uh, guys, what is the biggest take positive takeaway you have from the season at this point? And the biggest negative. I, I like that freshman class. I think there are a lot of good football players there. And I think there are some guys like Elijah Hughes, who once he had some weight, are going to turn into phenomenal players. But I, I think that's a good group. And, and I think it's an underrated recruiting class at this point, because I think there are a lot of good players. So that's the, that's the biggest positive. The biggest negative is everything else. And... <laughs> And I'm not celebrating Oregon season because they were far more successful than I wanted them to be. Uh, if Oregon goes two and ten next year, B. Davis, then we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, the the I was going to say exactly that. The freshman class, the freshman class is what you kind of take away from this. There's a lot of a lot of pieces in there, uh, and a lot of pieces at important spots. Right? You you liked what you got from what you saw a little, I guess, I guess you didn't love everything you got from the offensive line, but everything you heard and the the way the guys look up front on the offensive line, you got to see flashes at receiver and at running back. There's some guys in the, the defensive backfield. I mean, I think there's guys kind of all over the place there that you like. For me, the biggest negative was that Lincoln Riley seemed to really think, really believe going into this year that they were going to be better defensively. And to have that poor of a read on a big, big, big part of your program and your team uh, is is a really significant miss just in terms of kind of taking the temperature on that side. Yeah, I think the biggest positive was the freshman class. I mean, even if they didn't perform as well as they we had hoped, maybe attack at Curtis. Uh, but he gave it all. He came to play. When he hit somebody, he really hit him. Uh, obviously, uh, Zachariah Branch has been making some All-America teams, uh, special teams. So that's that was a positive. But I think the biggest negative was the wasted year of Caleb Williams, that he was wasted because they couldn't surround him with a decent defense. That goes back to what some of you have said on this question about the defense. But I cannot believe that a guy of the caliber of Caleb Williams could have a second season so pathetic in terms of the result. Uh, I felt sorry for him. I don't think he was handled well in dealing with the media. Uh, you know, that's part of being the Heisman Trophy guy. Uh, you have to accept the good and the bad. So uh, the Caleb Williams thing really, I thought, was a disaster. Uh, question seven from HUD San Diego. I guess that's HUD. Two questions. How would you compare Lincoln Riley's statements about our team cultures will be with what you already have observed the first two years? In other words, is the culture where it should be at this point in time? It's still to be determined. 
you know, I would like to see amplify. Excuse me, Chris. Uh, Mark, amplify that just a little bit. What you mean by that, please? I, I think he's kind of at the fork in the road right now. You know, there he's still he, he's still rebuilding what he thinks USC should have been when he arrived. I mean, you've heard him say it multiple times since he took the job, uh, and USC was in a place where it should never have been. So, yeah, I I agree with Chris. We would like to have seen it further along. I think that's where he was going. But right now, uh, it, it's kind of just stuck in neutral. And it's because it's the recruiting is stuck in neutral. And it's it's reliant upon the transfer portal. When you have a bunch of guys who are coming together from everywhere else, but weren't coming together together through the same recruiting class or classes, you don't have that bond. Everybody has their own agenda. And I think that makes Lincoln Riley's job extremely difficult trying to build that culture in that locker room when you've got guys coming over for a year who are being enticed by NIL. Some of them might not get everything that was promised to them. So it, again, there's just so much that goes on behind the scenes that yeah, I don't know if we're there yet. And it's hopefully it's going in the right direction. I I would like to see a far more disciplined football team than we saw this past year. That's an important part of culture. And um Great. And, and we didn't see it. So no, uh, I, I would have thought after year one, I thought, I thought the culture was coming along. That was a team that seemed to be together. They didn't play very good defense, but it, it seemed to be a team that was coming together. They had good leadership at a lot of positions and, and I thought we we're on the right track. Uh, but after what we saw last year, uh, I'm not sure anymore. This is, this is what I like about, I think where things are, are going is that, what Lincoln Riley did in this last off season was what he said they wanted to do, right? They wanted to throw a ton of big bodies up in that defensive front. And they did, they added, they added a bunch of guys up in that defensive front. They added three, what you assumed at the time were going to be very significant offensive line additions. He built, he tried to build inside out. He clearly now looking back had, misplaced faith in Alex Grinch running that defense and getting something out of it. And that, that did not work. What I like now this off season is he has dug into Danton Lynn. Everything we've heard about him is he brings an NFL mentality to the defensive side of the ball. And he knows how to coach defense. The, the new addition man is coming over from North Dakota state. He knows what defensive football looks like right the, those are again we we just base this on what we're seeing now and it's not on the field yet so you can't really say oh this worked but based on what he did last offseason let's just see if Alex Grinch can figure this out to based on what's going on now no 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 let's get people we believe truly know how to do this it feels like that culture he wants, he's still trying to do it. So no, it's not there. It's not, it's not there yet. They, they, USC is not going to go out on the field against Louisville and push them around on both sides of the line of scrimmage. Cause that's not what that program is right now. And that's the culture that Riley eventually wants it. It does feel like, again, we talked about the freshman offensive lineman he brought in that class, like the, a lot of the roster moves feel like they're made to go in that direction. The coaching moves now feel like they're kind of kind of following that as well. So I, I do think there's positives to it. But again, two years in, are you sitting here right now saying we feel about this program the way we felt it would be when Lincoln Riley was standing up there day one at the Coliseum talking about, look at this place, it's going to be you know, where, where football, the, the mecca of college football, and we're going to, you know, run college football, everything comes through the Coliseum in Los Angeles. No, you're, you're not there. You're not there right now. No. And I, I tell you, uh, the, the culture of the transfer portal, these players come in from all parts of the country, right? Some from the PAC 12, but other places as well. When I talk about culture, I think of culture. I think of Kevin Bruce. 
our our late member here who was with the Trojans and some of the others, they know what it feels to, to be a Trojan. They feel the legacy of who they're replacing. You get guys that come in for one year, they're here for one reason and one reason only. Probably, uh, if they're going to get a master's, great. But the reason is they want more exposure to try to get to the NFL. And I don't think it's win one for old SC. Uh, I, you know, if you get a player, may, I mean, it takes a while, even for guys who want to play at SC, sign with SC, come to SC to really experience that passion. And all of us have that passion, of course. But I don't think that some of these players have that passion. Uh, and I think it's very hard in one year to teach undisciplined players to be disciplined. Generally, it takes a couple of years for them to be disciplined. So I don't think the culture is there. Now, what they need is they need more players if they transfer in like Travis Dye, who wanted to play at USC, wasn't recruited at the time. He brought a passion to the team uh, because he not only was a very good player out of Oregon, but he knew what it meant to play at USC. It was meaningful to him. So he had a big motivational uh, reason to do that. Uh, question two, I think we touched on it from uh, HUD SD, but I'm going to say it because he asked it. What impact do you think uh, it is having on portal recruiting that no one yet knows publicly what assistant coaching changes will be made? Do they? Do the portal guys know more than we do? I think the portal guys want to know how much money they're going to get. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm sure assistant coaches have something to do with it, but feel feels like portal recruiting kind of goes through the the collectives first, and then the coaches. Yeah, it, it, that's a that's a sad but true comment. Uh, you know, it's not about SC was my dream school. It's like, all right, who's going to pay me the most money? I can live with the money uh, over the over my dream school. And haven't we heard that already? SC was my dream school. And then they signed with somebody else. And you go, well, if this is your dream school, why are you signing with everybody else or somebody else? And we all could come to the conclusion he got paid more money. Sad commentary, in my opinion. Uh, all right, let's finish up with question eight from You Gotta Love It. I'm going to clean up some of the language here. Is SC looking at hiring a full-time special teams coach? If not, recommend someone show them the okay i'm cleaning it up ucla game fight on are we going to get a special team coach it doesn't look like it no but georgia does not have a special teams coordinator alabama does not have a special teams coordinator he also coaches outside linebackers michigan does not have a special teams coordinator he also coaches safeties um so no none of the other none of the other top programs have a guy that's just devoted to special teams except ohio state who's under fire right now because their special teams are terrible this year. Uh, I, I mean, Lincoln Riley talks about it all the time. I said, I said it on the message board. It's the, the Nick Saban quote. I think it was at halftime. They were asking, I don't know, maybe about the health of a player. And he just said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer. So quit asking. That's what it feels like. Cause Lincoln Riley has been asked a few times about a special teams quarter. And, and his thought is just, he doesn't see, value in having a full-time coach solely dedicated to special teams during practice when special teams does not take up a third of your practice time he wants coaches coaching multiple play like th throughout practice somewhere off in defense and i've seen thoughts about well you can you know John Baxter, when he was here, I think for a little bit, coached tight ends as well as special teams. And you can put coaches like that. And I've heard people sort of say, you know, if there's one sort of unifying voice for all the special teams, but you have different guys on all the different units too. So it's it's not as if you really need that one direct, you know, voice talking to the punt coverage team and the field goal block team that are 11 potentially different guys. So it just isn't like he, like it Riley has said, if they adjust the number of on-field coaches, right. If all of a sudden you can get two more on-field coaches, which the NCAA is or at least it's been talked about kind of in, in years past, 
I, I don't know what number they need to go to, like 20 on field coaches before he decided, OK, we can we can get a special teams coach uh, in there. I, I just they were hit or miss on special teams. I think there were there were definitely some positives that, that you took um, from this season and, and the penalties are an issue. But that's a that's a top down program thing i think that that you have to address that's not just that's not just a special teams coach the, the thing that sticks out more than anything to the fans when they ask this question that comes up besides the, the penalties is the kicking you know how many special teams coaches are dedicated kicking specialists so i mean that's what you're asking about that's what you want can you bring in a kicking analyst i don't know what is ryan doherty's what does he analyze when he is? I mean, that's his job. He's the analyst for special teams. So look, sometimes you make them, sometimes you miss them at USC. I don't know if you bring in a John Baxter, if his coaching technique helps out Dennis Lynch with his with his kicking. Who knows? I don't know. I, I want don't... to find a guy who can get 10 guys who will block for Zach Branch. That's what I want. <laughs> Amen. That's what I want. I mean, it, it, the the fact that the fact that that unit got worse and worse as the year went on was extraordinarily frustrating. When you have a talent like that, find ten guys who will freaking block, give them a plan, and let's get some big plays. That drove me nuts. But I don't know that you need to have a full time special teams coordinator to do that. Whoever was in charge of that unit, I have no idea who it was. They did a terrible job. I'd replace them. It was bad. What we see at practice is you, you see Kyle McDonald working with one group of receivers. You see uh, Coach Luke Heward working with the other group, punchers and kickers. You don't see anything more than that as far as when they're lining up, you know, to do their, their kickoff coverage or their punt return coverage, or whatever. You get to see the jugs machine kicking off and punting to the receivers. That's what we see in special teams. It's all, I mean, Michigan... Michigan was 130 in kickoff return this year. Oregon was 129th in kickoff return this year. Like that, it never feels like the best teams are just absolutely dominant across the board in special teams. It almost feels like penalties, where it's like the the sloppy you are sometimes in in some of that stuff. The better you are as a as a team. I mean, obviously that's not the case, but it, it really, you know like Rutgers, a team like Rutgers is always like really good at special teams. I mean, it just, it's, it's Virginia interesting. Virginia Tech was for years, right? That was sort of their thing. They were sure. great yeah. special teams. Right? And it helped them win a lot of games. That's true. Yeah. You watch I'm going to blame Alex Grinch for that kick return unit. I don't even know if that's right, but I'm going to blame him just because I, it's sort of the, the, the groove I'm in now. I'm going to blame him for everything. <laughs> in front of Virginia Tech, you literally, you could watch every one of their games and you would anticipate at least one block punt or a field goal or an extra point every game. You knew it was coming. Yeah, but Frank Beamer, wouldn't you agree? He was a special teams guy, and and they put in a lot of time with special teams, and that's why Virginia Tech was always and, and that, a special right? teams guy. You, you've got to, if you're going to work on Lincoln Riley staff, you have to have special teams experience, right? You would think so. They so, do have a lot. I mean, I mean, almost everybody on that staff has coached special teams somewhere before. The question is, is, do they do it very well? <laughs> you know, I agree with Chris. You can't have 10 guys out there all looking at Branch to do something when you're not out there doing something. That's pretty frustrating to watch. I, I would agree with that. A reminder again, if you have a question or comments for our panel, go to the We Are SC members message board. Click on the thread that pertains to Inside the Trojan Settle viewer or listener questions. We thank all of you for really getting some really outstanding questions that the panel can try to debate and answer to so we're in overtime we're going to make this quick uh panel aside from the national championship game in houston if you could attend one bowl game in person this bowl season which game would it be and why chris arledge i was going to pick the bahamas bowl until i learned that it's being played in charlotte north carolina this year which is horrible. so i'm going i'm going hawaii bowl I don't even care who's playing. I would rather go to that game than any other college bowl game. <laughs> Mark? 
Yeah, I don't know who's playing in the Cotton Bowl, but I love the way they treat the media. So sign me up. I've been there. You, you, you're not stretching the imagination. Like it's all real. You, <laughs> like you're going on a cruise. There's just a, there's always a room open with food. Love it, <laughs> Eric. So it it's a two out of three for me. The the cheese it bowl. Because of the cheese it bowl, it's all the way in Orlando, which I'm not the the travel. I don't know, but I got, look. I got to see if the Iowa offense is actually a real thing, or if it's just this mythical TV production that we've seen throughout the year. But I I got I got to see it in person. I got to see it in person. So Iowa Tennessee in the cheese it bowl on the first i don't know if i can get back for the rose bowl it's the it's the same day like right at the end of it but if i if i could go double header there on on a bi-coastal double header that, that's what i'd do and i will wrap this up as a football purist i want to see i would like to see alabama versus uh michigan i think that would be to me from a in the rose bowl i think this year is going to be fantastic uh, if I had a secondary choice, it would be the Sugar Bowl to go to New Orleans, although I'm not real thrilled about New Orleans. You've seen Bourbon Street once. That's all you need to see it. It's a trash dump as far as I'm concerned. But, National but, World War II Museum, Greg. Best museum I've ever Oh, been. you know what? I was hoping you'd bring that up. You know, I could We're going to have a whole that. thing about New Orleans next week. I can already feel this. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> you should go sometime, even yeah, if you don't like Bourbon Street. Let's, you're let's, the guy that was just promoting bachelor parties. What's wrong with Bourbon <laughs> Street if you're a bachelor party connoisseur? Now, Chris, you've been to you've been to New Orleans, right? I like New Orleans. I like the food. I like the alligators there. It's good. <laughs> Beignets or po' boys? Which one, Chris? Beignets or po' boys? Um, <laughs> I go with the beignets, but but I like uh, but I like Cajun. I like Cajun food, so it's a good place to eat. I'll go with big days and a dinner cruise on the Mississippi and a paddle wheeler. It's a lot of fun. I've been there and done that. So, all right. Again, if you enjoyed Inside the Trojan Huddle, please click on the like and red subscriber <laughs> buttons. We greatly appreciate your support. Be sure to check out wersc.com and become a premium subscriber. That'll do it for this Tuesday's edition of Inside the Trojan Huddle. Reminder to watch four downs on Friday for the latest USC and college football information presented by Prize Picks. So until next Tuesday, a big thank you to our great panelists, Mark Culkin, Eric McKenney, Chris Arledge. Big special thank you to all of you for watching or listening to Inside the Trojan Huddle. Have a great week and weekend. So until next Tuesday, this is your moderator, Greg Katz, reminding you all to beat the Cardinals and fight on, everybody.